Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible. On this Resurrection Sunday, we turn to Psalm 118, where we find the human condition frail, feeble, and fragile. Or at least, that's how our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, describes it in his message, Delivered Out of Death. But don't worry, we have hope ahead. So, grab your copy of God's Word and find your seat on the Bible bus, and while you do that, Greg and I have got some great stories to share with you. They're really the best stories of our lives. Yeah, because they're stories of salvation, and it's all rooted in what we celebrate today. And so, Steve, we want to say to all of our listening family, Happy Resurrection Day. Amen. I love to say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. There it is. I love that. Love that. I love it as well. Now, today, let's go ahead and celebrate the event that impacts so many different people by hearing some testimonies. I think that would be helpful for us as people who have come to Christ. Here's from our Portuguese Bible bus listener. And this, by the way, was told to us from uh, a report from our producer. The testimony goes like this. Rita was a witch in southern Portugal, and everyone in town knew about her. One day, she tuned in to O Son de Livro. That's the name of the Portuguese Through the Bible program, by the way, and it means the sound of the book. She had been immersed in the world of the occult, but now she was hearing a new and different message. She became a regular listener, and God's Spirit began working in her heart. She asked the village priest to teach her more about the Bible and began meeting with him weekly. But after about a month, she stopped the visits because she was learning a lot more from the daily 30-minute radio program and decided to concentrate on that. But then the day came where Rita finally yielded to Christ and became a new creation. Jesus Christ turned her life around. Rita dumped her occult books and paraphernalia and is now a member of a local church. One day, she met our local team member in Portugal. He is the one who told us this story, and when she found out who he was, she fell at his feet weeping and said, My life has changed completely since I've listened to your program, the greatest happiness I've had in my life. You are the door that opens salvation to me. The love of God flows through you. Please don't stop this work. Wow. And Steve, some weeks ago, you actually were in Europe and met with the Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was encouraging. I, my mind went back to we attended, we were there on a Sunday. And so we went to this, you know, little church. There were maybe 50 people in it. Uh, and he was, uh, the pastor was teaching on Colossians. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And I just picture, you know, this woman in a church, probably very similar yeah. to that, um, known in her community as a witch. And now she is a professing believer in Jesus Christ. Well, and we don't always see lots of those kinds of things happening in a country like Portugal. So this is so significant to get that encouragement that God's word is at work. So now let's go halfway around the world to Kazakhstan, a place where I was actually not too long ago. And the Kazakh Bible bus got this response. It has been a year since I have believed. Now when I listen, I start crying Hmm. because even... Through the songs of praise, my heart overflows. Although I do not understand many things, I thank you and God for this opportunity when I can listen to God's word every day. I did not know Jesus before, but now my spiritual eyes are opened to many things. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. It is as if Jesus himself came through you to my home in East Kazakhstan. I can't write the name of the village yet. There are about a thousand Kazakh families living in this village. Out of them, I am the only one who is a believer. God chose me. Praise him. Wow. Wow. We hope that you are certainly encouraged, especially if you have a heart for this ministry, especially if you're on the World Prayer Team and you've been praying. This is some of the fruit Mm. that we're able to share, and hopefully that you're rejoicing with us as well. There is a new sister in Christ in Kazakhstan in a village where she's the only believer And it's because God chose to use this ministry to introduce them to Jesus Christ. So we would pray that you would continue to pray for the ministry of Through the Bible so that more people can be reached. And we know that she's getting good, solid Bible teaching just based on the elements of her story and what she's saying Mm. back to us that we don't have time to go through because we have more that we (laughs) want to read. Yes, we do. Yes. So here's one from right here in the U.S. Today I was on a hunt for a tool for my garage. Isn't that how it always is? God uses our mundane, vain pursuits to enter the scene and transform everyone involved. Anyway, a stranger came by to drop off a tool I wanted to purchase. I had previously emailed your staff to get some Bible bus passes, so I had them on hand. 
There were a few times I wanted to hand them out, and I forgot. This time I remembered. As I talked to the stranger, I learned that his dad passed away two days earlier. As I handed him the money for the tool, I also handed him a Bible bus pass and simply said, this changed my life. I want to share it with you, or something like that. I didn't go into some super long explanation or debate. As he left, I stood by my garage door, weeping almost uncontrollably, Mm. because God had taken my small act of obedience, and I know he will bless it. I hope to see that man in heaven one day. I can honestly say I felt the Lord's presence in that moment, and all because of a little blue Bible bus pass. Wow, such an encouragement. And hopefully you're encouraged by that as well, to give opportunities. And yeah, use the Bible bus passes. We give them out for free in packs of 10. Just call us and we'll send them to you. But that you would boldly proclaim Jesus Christ in the opportunities that you have, in the everyday interactions that you have. Um, may God open the door for you, and you may you be faithful to walk through that door when it presents itself. Greg, we're almost out of time. Why don't you pray for us? Father, you've shown us that you are constantly at work in deep, meaningful, eternal ways in the lives of people. And Lord, we know you work through your body in many ways, many great ministries, and we're just one, but we thank you that we get to play a part and we pray we'd be faithful. And now we celebrate the most important day in history, the day that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. We praise you in his name. Amen. Now here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. This morning we are not taking a text, but we are inviting you to several verses of Scripture in the 118th Psalm, beginning with the 17th verse. This is not a text, but is a point of departure for us. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me so, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Our subject for this message today is delivered out of death. Man has probed the inner recesses of the little atom. He has discovered its hidden secrets and he's released the inexhaustible power of this little atom. Man likewise has pushed the frontier of exploration beyond the confines of this little earth into outer space. He's put into orbit a small satellite about the earth, and even gone beyond that, and he's put a speck into orbit about the sun. The frontier is no longer out west somewhere. The frontier is somewhere in illimitable space. And man today is looking for new worlds to conquer. And he's dreaming of roaming through space. Man today has probed into the little atom. He has penetrated into space. But there is one area that has not yielded to the penetrating skill and ability of man. There's one sphere today where man stands hopeless and helpless. Man has actually fallen in defeat in the presence of death. The Scripture says, in Adam all die. That hasn't been changed. The Scripture says, by man came death. That's still true. Man has not been able to revoke that one whit. Man, by his own ingenuity and his own power, 
has not altered that for the past 6,000 years of human history. No advance has been made in this field. Oh, he can prolong life today, but all he does is postpone the evil day and death comes at last to mock man when he attempts today to extend his life down here. Not only has death invaded the race of mankind, but death has instituted today a reign of terror. Believe me, man in his long history has looked at death with terror. It was 1900 years ago when our Lord came that the Romans at that time had coined 39 similes that spoke of death. They called it the eternal night. They called it the mower with the scythe. We know him today as Father Time. The hunter with the snares and the demon that was out to poison mankind. There were many other ways. And men have, have been afraid of death. May I say to you that man stands today in terror of death. Death is an enemy of mankind today. We cannot escape it. The Scripture says, death reign by one. One man brought into this world a rule of death that's come upon the human family. Men can't change it. They haven't been able to do anything about it with all their vaunted ability and knowledge and gadgets today. But we've attempted another method, and in our day, secularism and self-indulgence have just about brainwash the average American so that he's been lulled asleep by all the comforts that are at our fingertips today. And we've been doped by the cults that are around us today. And they say death's not real. That's not so bad after all. It's just a long sleep. Many would like to believe that today. A celebrated infidel in France not long ago made this statement, which a great many would make right along with him. He says, there's one thing that mars all the pleasures of my life. And a friend of his who knew him well was startled and asked him in amazement, what's that? He says, I'm afraid the Bible is true. If I could know for certain that death is an eternal sleep, I should be happy. My joy would be complete, but here is the thorn that stings me. This is the sword that pierces my very soul. If the Bible is true, I'm lost forever. May I say to you today that the world is pushed up into a corner today and is having to face up to it whether Jesus Christ came back from the dead or not. For 1900 years ago, an event took place, and that event is the greatest in the history of the world. Yonder in the empty tomb, it was stated in very simple language, He is not here, He is risen, as He said. My friend, today, that's a historical fact. That's a historical fact that is ascertained any way you ascertain any historical fact. It's a subject of inspection and examination. It can be corroborated, and today it can be substantiated and established by history by historical criteria, by documenting the evidence that Jesus Christ came back from the dead. He showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. This morning we're going to follow an unusual pathway. It's one of the most conspicuous and conclusive proofs that's connected with his resurrection. It's the fulfillment of prophecy. Every detail in the life of our Lord was predicted, and it was followed with meticulous detail, including his resurrection. 
you will find that he himself, after his resurrection, when his disciples seemed so startled when he appeared to them. And first, yonder on the Emmaus Road, as he opened the scriptures, he could say to those men, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have said. He based it upon the Old Testament prediction. And then when he was with his disciples, closeted in the room there that first day, Luke gives us this record, Luke 24, verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. This morning we're going to do something a little different. We are going to enter the empty tomb from the other side. Most of us have to wait till the stone is rolled away and go in from this side. May I say to you that the Old Testament will take us in the back way, which after all is the front entrance to that tomb. And so this morning, I want us to go to the Psalms. Somebody says, well, is his resurrection in the Psalms? That is a more complete picture of him back in the book of Psalms than you'll find in the Gospels. For instance, the Gospels say he went to the mountain to pray. The Psalms tell you what he prayed. The Gospels say he was crucified. The book of Psalms will tell you what went on in his heart and life and mind when he was being crucified. The Gospels say he ascended into heaven. The book of Psalms follows him right on to God's right hand. Now, the resurrection is likewise in the book of Psalms. Somebody says this morning, you mean the resurrection is mentioned back there? Yes. Not only so, but the first sermon that was ever preached in the church, the sermon on the day of Pentecost, took its text from the 16th Psalm. Simon Peter, when he stood up to preach, he took a text. And he went back to the 16th Psalm, and will you listen to him? In Acts 2.25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Then Simon Peter explained what he meant by, by that scripture. He says that David, he seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So that was the first sermon ever preached in the church. And my beloved, every sermon preached in the church was a Easter sermon. We have just one a year. I have two, but that's unusual. Generally one sermon a year. But every sermon preached in the early church, everyone recorded, is a sermon that's an Easter sermon that has the resurrection at the very heart. And so... The book of Psalms tell us of the resurrection. I'm not turning this morning to the 16th Psalm, which it sets forth the resurrection. The 116th does, but we're turning today to the 118th Psalm. It records the death, the resurrection, and the coming again of our Lord Jesus. It's the last of the Messianic Psalms, beginning with Psalm 2. And going through to Psalm 118, you have in us first a group of psalms known as Messianic Psalms. They are called that because in the New Testament they are quoted as referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I personally believe every psalm is about him. In fact, the book of Psalms is a him book, H-I-M book. It's all about him, but these psalms we know our messianic psalms, they're so stated. 
Now, the 118th Psalm is quoted in several places in the New Testament. Martin Luther said of the 118th Psalm, listen to him, the 118th Psalm is my psalm, which I love. Without it, neither emperor nor king, though wise and prudent, nor saints could have helped me. You read that psalm. Put yourself in Martin Luther's shoes, and you'll see why. When this man could read here, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what ma can man do unto me. That's the thing that brought in the Protestant Reformation. So it's not a mess this morning to turn to this psalm. This psalm is what is known as a Hallel psalm. From Psalm 113 through 118, you have the Hallelujah psalms, if you please, and they were sung at the Passover feast. Will you listen now very carefully? We read in the Gospels that when our Lord gathered with his own yonder at the last Passover, that they sang a hymn and went out. You know what they sang? They sang the 118th Psalm. That was the last. That's the hymn. They began with 113, and all during the supper they sang these psalms, but when they got to the last, they sang a hymn and went out. I do not know what that does to you, but I think I have read this psalm in the past few years a hundred times. And when I read it, I think of that night when he left the upper room, a dark night, and went out yonder, and as he went, he sang this psalm that speaks of him. He alone that night understood its meaning. No wonder he, after his resurrection, it says that he opened to them the scriptures that they might understand its meaning. For that night they didn't understand as they were singing. He did understand. And this morning... We want to turn to this psalm. Now, I'm just lifting out that which speaks of the resurrection in particular. Will you notice it? We have, first of all, in verses 17 and 18, the meaning of the resurrection given here in three phases. First of all, we have the defeat of death. Listen, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chased me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. That's the first meaning, defeat of death. The second meaning is the door to heaven is opened. Will you notice? Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I'll praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Then we have the design and doing of God revealed. Will you notice this? I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Now, first of all, will you note this morning the defeat of death? Let me read it again. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me so, but he hath not given me over unto death. What a picture we have here. You re will recall that God had said to Adam, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And Adam died. And all that are in that line since then. Paul put it like this in the fifth chapter of Romans, the twelfth verse, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned in Adam. Adam's sin brought death upon the human family, so that even a little baby dies today that has not even committed a sin itself. Death has passed upon the human family. There came into the human family 1,900 years ago one who was holy, harmless, undefiled, took upon himself our humanity, but he was separate from sinners. He did not have to die. He said as much that he did not have to die. I want you to listen to him. 
He says in John 10, 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He didn't have to die. He could have missed death. The Lord Jesus Christ could have adopted the policy of disengagement. He could have retired. He could have detoured. He could have withdrawn. He could have adopted the procedure of missing death altogether, and he could have stepped off of this earth back into heaven with not one scar upon him. He didn't have to die. And do you know that's where he was tempted? When Satan first came to him, the first suggestion he made to him was, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. If you fall down and worship me, you can miss the cross if you want to. and You'll still get the kingdom. And he would have. That was the temptation given to him. Even Nicodemus, a good man, if you please, didn't realize when he said to him, he, he wanted to talk to him, and our Lord interrupted him and said, you can't even see the kingdom of God till you've been born again. Oh, Nicodemus, we can't even bring in the kingdom of God without the cross. Ye must be born again, but the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That's the way the Son of Man must be lifted up. That was a temptation to him. And yonder, six months before he died in Caesarea Philippi, these disciples came to him. And you'll recall that that was the first time he'd ever mentioned the cross to them. It was something new. The first time he even mentioned his resurrection to them. Will you listen? In Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Simon Peter said, Lord, far be that from thee. And our Lord says, get thee behind me, Satan. You're trying to get me to miss the cross. He could have missed the cross. When he's hanging there on the cross, all of the groups that are gathered there kept saying to him, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Don't die. My friend this morning, he came down to this earth, took upon himself not the nature of angels, but the nature of man, that he might taste death for every man. He met death head on. He went right on through it. And this morning, did you notice our subject is not delivered from death? Our subject is delivered out of death. He said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And he died yonder on the cross, paying a price, the penalty for your sin. You and I are guilty before God. He paid that penalty. He died a vicarious, substitutionary death there for you and me. Now listen to him. Listen to him. I shall not die, but live. He went through death and he came out, never to die again. And he says, I shall not die but live. Will you listen to him after his resurrection and even his ascension when he appeared to the apostle John who'd been so familiar with him? He reclined on his bosom in the upper room, but now he falls at his feet as dead. And the Lord Jesus, the glorified, resurrected Lord, now put his hand upon him. Listen to him. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth. I am the living one. I shall not die, I am alive. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. My beloved, this morning, 
That's exactly what Peter meant yonder when he was speaking on the day of Pentecost, when he made that very clear, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And now the living Christ says, I shall not die, but live. I'm the living one. I was dead. I went down through death for you. And I came out in mighty power by his resurrection from the dead. Something else happened. The door to heaven was open. Will you listen again to this verse here? Open to me the gates of righteousness. I'll go into them and I'll praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. You notice what our Lord said in Revelation 1, 17 and 18 again. He says here, I am he that liveth. I'm the living one. I was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. That's a very unfortunate translation. Hell really means here, it's the word in the Hebrew, Sheol, or Hades in the Greek. It merely means the unseen world. It means the grave. Sometimes it means the place where the spirit goes. Sometimes it means the place where the body goes. And what he's saying here is, I have the keys of the grave and of death. Well, you see, at death, for the believer today, the grave gets the body. But we are told that the Spirit goes immediately to be with Christ for the believer. Paul put it like this, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And so the the grave gets the body. Now the Lord Jesus says, I have the keys of the grave where the body is and of death where the spirit is. Death today for the child of God, will you hear me, is a door to heaven and Christ holds the key. Death is not a state, it's an act. It's a door, not a room in which folk enter. It's not a condition, it's a transition. It's no longer, if you please, a dead-end street. It now, for the child of God, leads right into the presence of God. Listen to him. The gates of righteousness. I want you to notice that. The gate open to me, the gates of righteousness. What does that mean? That means, friends, that you and I have to be right with God. And do you know today that you and I cannot be right within and of ourselves? Psychology is saying today that all of us have anxieties and a guilt complex. Every one of you have got it. Oh, you try to smother it. People today are eating barbiturates like M&M &M chocolate drugs, in order to try to escape from the fact they've got that down deep and under. You and I, my friend, today, we are guilty. How can we be right with God? That's all righteousness means. Listen to Paul again in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He's delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. Now, you and I might stand righteous, right before God. Open to me the gates of righteousness. And when he came forth from the dead, the way to God is open, for he is really the gate. He really is the door. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And we are told today to come with boldness to his throne of grace, 
because he's made a new and living way to God, and that new and living way is by his death and his resurrection that he's opened back to God today for every sinner to come. Will you notice in conclusion, we have here the design and doing of God revealed. Will you listen to verse 22? The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Christ was refused by the nation Israel. He became to them a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Paul said he's become foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling stone to the Jews. Way back, though, in their history, God had been schooling them. Yonder in the wilderness, Moses was told to smite the stone and the water came forth from the rock. Paul says Christ was that rock. He's the smitten stone. That's what he is today, the smitten stone. But he's coming again. He's coming again. Will you listen? Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He took that also. And he said, you rejected me and refused me. He wept over Jerusalem, and he says, Ye will not see me again until ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. He's coming again, and when he comes again, he'll become the headstone of the corner. He's coming in judgment to judge the nations of this world. Daniel saw the picture of that image that sets forth the nations of the world. And then he saw a stone cut out without hands that smote the image on its feet. He's coming in judgment. He's coming in judgment to judge the individual. The Lord Jesus says here, he says, haven't you ever read that the stone with the, which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner? Now his invitation is, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. When he comes the next time, he comes as the crashing stone to this earth. Today he's the smitten stone, and you can fall on him today. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. This is a troubled world we are living in today. People are perplexed and puzzled about the future. They are baffled and beaten today. They are tested and tempted today. Discouraged and defeated, groping and gasping. Mankind finds itself today frail and feeble and fragile. Maybe today you come in here at Wits End Corner. You raise the question, what's life all about? What's the answer? May I say to you that you won't find the answer today in science. Philosophy won't answer your question. That's no answer to life. Psychologists said years ago when I was studying psychology, they said we shall yet produce a well-integrated personality. Psychology says today, down deep and under, there's that guilt complex. It's there, and you can't get rid of it. Life magazine in the editorial tells of a Lutheran church in Berlin. That Lutheran church is right smack dab on the border between West and East Berlin. The pastor lives in East Berlin, and this Easter they have put out in front of the church the message for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us that are saved it's the power of God. I wonder if I dare conclude by reading the last part of this editorial. Will you listen? What seems foolishness to a secular mind 
can be the greatest wisdom and joy to the soul that confronts its own guilt and anxious nature. To all who believe in him, the risen Jesus Christ proving God's love for man is the only perfect answer to the intellectual question of man's destiny and predicament. He's also the answer to the sorrowful, the baffled, or even desperate individual whose anxiety may be ineradicable, but whose sins are forgiven and whose humanity is vindicated forever. This morning, will you look with me not in the empty tomb? Will you look with me at the living Christ? I shall not die, but live. This is the gate through which the righteous shall go. And he says today, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. Oh, this world today is troubled and shaken. God says, I'll shake everything so you can see that there are things that cannot be shaken. He's that one. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid. Jesus Christ, my friend today, trouble, burden, carrying your sin with you today, why don't you bring it to this Savior? He has the answer. He has the answer to your intellect. He has the answer today to your will, to your emotions, to your body today. Why don't you come to him? I'm wondering today if you have something new on the inside as well as something new on the outside. Are you carrying stifled and smothered underneath today a burden, you're troubled about life, wondering about the future, a hope today is in a Savior. We remember today that he came back from the dead. He has the answer for you and for me. Multitudes have come to him, not just today, but for 1,900 years they've been coming to him, and he's met their need just like to bring to a focal point your thinking and would like to say with heads bowed, God's people praying, you'd just like to say, Preacher, this morning, remember me. Remember me. I do need to know this Savior. I do need to come to this one who is a burden bearer. I need this living Savior today. Oh, bring, my friend, in this moment, bring your thinking to this point, and then exercise your will, and say, I will, to Him. Would you like to know more about how you can lay down your troubles and burdens and receive the hope that Dr. McGee mentioned? If so, you can visit ttb.org and search for How to Know God. There you're going to find several resources that will tell you more about the eternal life that God offers us through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. If you'd prefer to have a couple of these resources mailed to you, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can always write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, it's Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. I'm Steve Schwetz, wishing you joy as we celebrate God's gift of forgiveness made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate today. He is risen indeed. Jesus came home, home to him I home. Sin had left a crimson sin. Join us each weekday for our five-year daily study through the whole Word of God. Check for times on the station or look for Through the Bible in your favorite podcast store and always at ttb.org.